for all tuning in. Some of you may be coming from various places along the Connecticut River Valley. Um, from my home in what is called Conway, Massachusetts, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I stand on Nipmuc land, and I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohican and Pequot to the south, the Mohican and Mohawk to the west, and the Abenaki and Penacooks to the north. I'm Polly Byers, and I am the executive director of the Karuna Center for Peacebuilding, which is an NGO based in Amherst, Massachusetts. For those of you who may not know, Karuna started a little over 27, uh, 25 years ago, focused on bridging divides in countries affected by violence and conflict, and has worked in over 40 countries using a variety of approaches to support dialogue and foster reconciliation. Um, and we're very pleased to welcome you all to today's talk by James Young, which is part of Karuna Center's series Erasure and Restoration. And as many of you may know by now, this is a lecture, workshop, and dialogue series that explores both historical and current narratives around local indigenous presence, as well as the ongoing settler mindset that has contributed to the threat and myth of erasure. And today we're really looking forward to talking and thinking about memorialization and the different roles it can play, sometimes serving in the name of justice and others perpetuating falsehoods, uh, including the myth of erasure. But um, before I begin, I just have to uh, briefly say that I'd like to acknowledge uh, the tragic events of yesterday in Washington, DC. Um, and I'm sure many of us are still in shock. Um, some of us may have witnessed uh, political violence of different kinds in our lives, either here or overseas. And Karuna's work for 27 years has been dedicated to recovering from conflict and addressing grievances and fostering reconciliation. Um, and I don't think any of us ever expected to see what we saw yesterday in Washington, DC. Um, and on the positive side, we have just heard that the Massachusetts state legislature just voted to change the state flag and seal, which is a very big deal. Um, so I think it's gonna be interesting to think about these things and reflect as we listen to James. Um, just as a reminder, please keep yourselves on mute throughout the event, but feel free to use the chat box um, and we'll look forward to addressing questions during the question and answer. And finally, I'd like to thank Mass Humanities and the Mass Cultural Council and the Ellis L. Phillips Foundation, without whom the series would not be possible, and to Christina Downing from Karuna Center, who makes it all happen. So James Young is a distinguished university professor emeritus of English and Judaic and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And he's the founding director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at UMass Amherst. Professor Young is the author of many books and has written widely on public art, memorials and national memory. His articles and reviews and op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, Book Review, the op-ed pages, the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune, and many, many others. Um, and his book, The Texture of Memory, won the National Jewish Book Award in 1994. And most recently, or relatively recently, he was appointed by the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation to jury the National 9-11 Memorial Design Competition, which was won by Michael Arad and Peter Walker in 2004 and opened on September 11th in 2011. Um, James is also a member of the advisory committee for this series, which is a group of native and non-native allies uh, working with us to help guide it in a thoughtful day. And we're really grateful for his contribution and excited to hear from him today. So I'm going to hand it over to James, who's going to talk for 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to leave it open for question and answer. So over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, both Polly and Christina, uh, for having me, for arranging this great series. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, you know, going to reflect on the ways that um, uh, different groups have commemorated events which would go against what I call the the national grain uh, of memory, um, events that um, uh, you know can strike shame into us. You know, we might even you know wonder down the road, you know, how to commemorate you know the insurrection yesterday, you know, in you know, Capitol Hill. Um, how to do that and, and how to make that kind of that shame and disgrace part of our, our national heritage uh, in a way. And I've been reflecting on these things mostly in the context of uh, the Holocaust, the mass murder of you know, nearly 6 million Jews by the uh, Nazi Germany and its collaborators. Um, but I found this um, uh, really after the Vietnam Veterans Memorial designed by Maya Lin, that a vernacular uh, has been generated um, 
for ways uh, to challenge the very conventional memorial designs that are typically kind of self-aggrandizing and monumental and uh, self-congratulatory um, and that you know, propagate you know, national myths more than they actually might commemorate the, a national crime, uh, maybe at the very heart of, you know, of, of memory, of national memory. And um, so with that in mind, um, I'll talk about the things I know about. And, and none of this is to be prescriptive. You know, when we begin to think about how our communities um, end up commemorating or not commemorating uh, indigenous peoples, you know, were, who were, you know, been, been here for the ages. And um, when we, you're going to see kind of a preoccupation uh, with erasure, by the way, uh, in several of these memorials and how to formalize erasure and voids without filling them in is very much a preoccupation by uh, contemporary artists and memorial architects, uh, in fact. Um, <clears throat> so again, this isn't to be prescriptive, but it's just to uh, begin a conversation about how other groups have done something um, that uh, you know that we might be trying to do or might be trying to you know frame in some way, and I'm going to end up with the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, which I believe is America's greatest uh, counter memorial. Um, I, I think this memorial and Maya Lin's memorial uh, are really the the two great um, bookends of um, uh, counter memorials uh, in this country, and um, and you'll 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 see actually that in some ways, uh, Brian Stevenson has openly acknowledged uh, uh, the design in Montgomery's debt to the Denkmal uh, design in Berlin, uh, the Denkmal for the six million, uh, for the murdered Jews of Europe. And it's not a matter of borrowing or appropriating or you know quoting or anything like that, but there is very much a contemporary vernacular uh, that you know, gets picked up and creates kind of an arc um, of memorial uh, forms you know, I would say from World War One, you know, to the very to the present moment, <clears throat> uh, with the rejection of uh, very conventional uh, memorial design. So, with that, I'm going to share a slide screen here. So everybody can see this big picture. Um, this is actually um, a memorial design, uh, which um, Maya Lin has told me, uh, helped inspire uh, her Vietnam Veterans Memorial design. This is from the Ile de Cité in Paris. It is the memorial to the deported Jews um, of France. A fairly early uh, design, in fact, uh, conceived first by Henri Pangrichon in the late 1950s, uh, dedicated um, in 1962. And um, he uh, <clears throat> wanted to kind of uh, counterpoint, I think, the very conventional, traditional uh, kind of soaring memorials, even like the one right behind me, the photographer here. This is on the Ile de la Cité with Notre Dame, the Grand Cathedral, li literally right behind me in, in this picture. And so this memorial um, is, as you see, not vertical. Uh, but horizontal. He's, he's created a little garden, a rose garden in front uh, uh, of this memorial, uh, thorny rose bushes in the shape of a triangle. In this case, it turns out to be kind of a red triangle, uh, a preoccupation perhaps with the, um, uh, the political prisoners. Uh, the Jews, of course, were not political prisoners. Uh, the stars they wore and the badges they wore would have been the six-pointed you know, yellow star. Uh, but when they were also political prisoners, they would have worn both a red uh, triangle and also a yellow triangle, creating a six-pointed star out of both colors. <clears throat> It's a very narrow passageway as you descend into this passageway. And remember, we're not, we're not ascending as you would the very conventional memorial, but we're descending into this negative space <clears throat> that ends up occluding the sky. Um, we get, you can see the very tip there of the Notre Dame you know, Cathedral, uh, the very tip top of the spire right there. This is a, a design which has actually been um, opened up in the ground, carved out of the ground. 
um, you're also kind of uh, trapped in it. It's like a crypt. The only view out other than the sky is this uh, graded window here looking out onto the uh, River Seine. Um, you can look across the river kind of over toward the bank, but if you're actually across the river looking at this, what you end up seeing is a, uh, it's almost like the big prow of a ship going right into the middle of the, the River Seine. And we are standing kind of inside the, inside the little elbow there, this triangular space. Again, this, this negative space, this triangular space. And this um, struck my uh, on several levels. Uh, first, that it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a hard positive form, but it was an empty space that made, that made all the difference here. Um, it wasn't the very traditional um, uh, kind of military, militarized uh, memorial space where you've got like the, the jutting elbow or the flying wedge, but in fact, it's, this, it's the space behind that flying wedge. So she's taken um, the very traditional military, uh, the most aggressive architectural form there is, the, the, jutting, the jutting elbow like this. Uh, the tip of the spear, the tip of the arrow, the most aggressive form there is in architecture. And instead of taking that, she's taken this inside of the elbow, opened up that space into which we descend. So from the outside, of course, this design um, is almost invisible, you know, from Constitution Avenue, um, because it's just below, it's just below grade. She designed the um, the two um, you know, legs, if you will, uh, to, uh, one to one to point at the Washington Monument, uh, one to the Lincoln Memorial. She wanted to integrate it into the memorial vernacular of the mall, but clearly in its polished black design, she wanted to counterpoint the great white neoclassic monoliths like the Washington Monument, like the white Capitol building, all these soaring white uh, you know, monu you know, traditional monumental structures with the counterpoint um, dug into the ground. The only figures in this monument um, are the people, the visitors themselves, seeing the reflections here perfectly human proportioned, unlike the, you know, very conventional memorials uh, monuments of, of, you know, gigantic people, you know, making us feel very, very small. And so this was, again, to return the memorial to something uh, humanly scaled and humanly proportioned, and not to overwhelm us with something so gargantuan that it makes us feel uh, basically insignificant and, you know, kind of unworthy somehow. This is also a way to confront us uh, with the memory that we bring um, so that we basically have to look into our own faces and the faces of others here and remember that we're, and to remember that we're rem remembering together um, and collectively. Um, her words are really uh, kind of trenchant here as well. I'd like to quote um, part of what, how she described her own design. <clears throat> In her words, she imagined taking a knife and cutting into the earth, opening it up, an initial violence and pain that in time would heal. That is basically she opened a space in the landscape. She cut in and opened a space in the landscape, which she hoped would cut into us and open the space within us for memory. She says, I never looked at the memorial as a wall or as an object but as an edge to the earth, an open side. So instead of that positive V form, you know, like the, you know, um, like the, the, the jutting elbow or the spear tip or, or the flying wedge, <clears throat> she has taken and opened up the V's obverse space, the space behind the aggression into the place of the embrace that takes care of us. Not the one that injures us, but the place that takes care of us. Um, and moreover, and something that is really, really interesting, she says, the memorial is composed not as an unchanging monument, which is really important for this contemporary generation, <clears throat> but as a moving composition 
to be understood as we move into and out of it. That is, as a monument is traditionally a fixed and static thing in a landscape, her memorial would now be defined by our movement through its space, memory by means of perambulation. And this um, just unlocked the idea of the memorial for a whole generation of memorial designers. Um, this was, uh, uh, this competition was won in 1980. It was uh, dedicated in 1982. Uh, Maya had spent her junior year in, uh, in France and came back for her senior year at Yale in architecture uh, and then took this monuments class um, and the whole class submitted designs for the, uh, the international blind competition for a Vietnam veterans memorial. And this one uh, won the prize and was built. <clears throat> so this negative form, this invitation to come in and to go out. So it's, it's basically memory by means of perambulation, remembering and walking at the same time animating uh, the site with movement and not allowing it to become uh, fossilized and fixed and static. Uh, again, really important for a whole generation of artists and architects who hated traditional memorial uh, design and, and forms because they were dead. You know, they were static, they were unyielding, uh, they were overweening, uh, they dominated us, they made us, made us feel small and, and, and insignificant. And that was a way that, in fact, traditional governments, you know, wanted us to feel. You know, the regimes that created these gigantic monuments always wanted them to seem, uh, wanted themselves to seem, as permanent and gigantic in comparison to us, um, uh, as, as they hoped and dreamed themselves to be. Um, so these authoritarian um, memorial cultures of the former Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, in particular. Uh, fetishized the monument and and this colossal you know uh, kind of monumental uh, scale um, for the ways that it actually uh, made the individual almost disappear <clears throat> and you know become only a uh, a collective government um, a, you know form much much bigger than any individual and what happened in in Germany after this is that suddenly um, the the Germans said well. So Maya Lin has now designed a memorial for a war which Americans came to abhor, uh, a war whose, whose vets actually were then reviled by Americans when they came home. Um, she's taken a, a form and counterpointed all the very traditional and conventional memorial attributes um, that actually make us feel small. Um, she's found a form um, to remember something that Americans might actually prefer to forget. How do you remember something that you might prefer to forget and, and put behind you? And for um, this generation of, of German artists in particular, they now realize that um, the, you know, the, the mold has been broken and that you know, Maya Lin wasn't prescribing anything to them or telling them how to do anything, but suddenly this generation was looking for ways to uh, commemorate um, absence with absence, the void left behind uh, World War II and the Holocaust, uh, a void um, that they would not want to redeem in any way with beautiful art, how to remember something terrible, you know, without making it look beautiful and without domesticating it. And these things were very much on, on the minds of, um, of this generation of artists. So in the very first competition for a national memorial, uh, to remember Europe's murdered Jews uh, in Berlin. Uh, there was some 526 submissions uh, from many, many, you know, from dozens of countries. And one of those submissions um, uh, was this one by Horst Hoheisel, in which he proposed taking the Brandenburger Tor, which is of course the, uh, the national monument, German national monument. And in his words, uh, blowing it up and grinding it into dust um, and then spread out uh, over the, the whole space of this memorial complex, the area will be opened up <clears throat> uh, with, you know, with giant plates. And then in his words, as the memorial, two blank voids are created uh, in, <clears throat> uh, in its double voids. And this is the monument, the voids of the monument. Um, 
they will be filled by the people who now come looking for memory. How better to remember uh, the destruction of a people by a nation than by destroying that nation's national monument? How better to propose that in fact, something like this perhaps can never be commemorated in a monument at all. And maybe that was part of the point um, that this, you know, designing a monument to remember a national crime uh, is, has the, the dual purpose of remembering and of covering over this national crime with a single form, creating monolithic meaning, and perhaps even redeeming the national crime, you know, with kind of um, a new national, um, new national guilt and, uh, and um, you know, kind of more responsibility now. And this generation of artists wanted nothing like that. <clears throat> Um, a few years earlier, uh, Jochen and Esther Gertz, Esther uh, Shalev Gertz was uh, an Israeli, actually born in Vilna, immigrated to Israel when she was eight, and um, uh, ended up uh, marrying Jochen Gertz, uh, a German born in Berlin in 1943, actually right in the middle of the war. And um, they both had a great distaste for monuments. And in fact, uh, Jochen's work uh, was um, all about self-effacement uh, before this. Um, he had uh, disappearing artwork. Um, he would do sound videos where he would scream at the top of his lungs until his voice ran out and then continue you know, screaming into the wind. He would create artwork on a floor uh, that would take him three or four days and then they would open the gallery and as people came in, they would scuff it all off. So the whole point was that he wanted to create art that you internalize, that once seen, it would no longer live in the landscape, but now live, live inside you. That these memorials, uh, and if you designed a memorial, it should be something that you take away. You should be changed inwardly by your experience, not come to pay your respects, turn around and leave it behind. It's something that you need to take with you, memory to take with you. So he and uh, Esther proposed and uh, won this competition in Hamburg uh, for a memorial for peace and against um, you know, war and violence, a generic Holocaust memorial, a 12 meter tall uh, lead covered column. And then uh, they invited the citizens of Harburg. Harburg is a, a kind of an immigrant neighborhood across the river from uh, Hamburg and visitors to the town to add their names here to ours. In doing so, we commit ourselves to remain vigilant. As more and more names cover this 12 meter tall lead column, it will gradually be lowered into the ground. One day it will disappear completely and the site of the Harburg monument against fascism will be empty. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. And this last sentence for me is, is maybe the most important um, kind of uh, epiphany um, they had. They feared, these two artists feared that all this Holocaust memorial making um, was becoming a substitute for action. That is, instead of intervening in contemporary genocides or contemporary you know, uh, mass murders, we were making memorials instead. And so, in the end, since it's only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice, we are the ones who will be left standing in this place. The memorial disappears, returning the burden of memory to those of us coming, you know, who come looking for it, in effect. And it's an amazing insight. And of course, they want to be challenging all these other conventions too, a memorial that disappears, um, a memorial that does not remain static, a memorial that invites its own violation. Um, and here they're, you know, they're wrestling with a, a fundamental German you know, dilemma, conundrum, um, how to reunite Germany on the bedrock memory of its crimes, of, its, uh, of the murder of six, you know, six million Jews um, and many, many others. How to, um, how to integrate into the national memorial heritage uh, a, a national crime committed against another people. And those remain questions more than answers. 
And so these two artists have created uh, something that disappears and kind of leaves us with more questions perhaps, you know, than answers. Um, but that was part of the point. So of course, at the beginning, everybody signed their names nice and dutifully. Um, you know, and it's, you know, kind of uh, using a steel stylus in the soft lead to write their names. But before long, it was full of graffiti, uh, swastikas, uh, magic marker pen. Um, it, it had become uh, an eyesore uh, for the mayor, uh, for the neighbors, and they wanted to get rid of it. <clears throat> and the artist replied simply, well, we are getting rid of it. Uh, the faster you fill up a meter and a half section with whatever you're going to fill up, um, the faster we will sink it into the ground. And they said, but it's ugly. It's become a trap for graffiti and filth. And the artist simply replied and said, well, in effect, doesn't every monument or memorial reflect back to you your own preoccupations? It, isn't the swastika also a signature, a kind of signature? You know, th these memorial spaces are just big mirrors holding holding up society you know, to, to uh, as a way to see itself, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So they agreed. And so between 1986, when this was dedicated, and 1993, when it was finally sunk altogether, they had 10 different sinkings. Uh, the press would come out, uh, new, newspapers and uh, radio and, and TV stations would watch, you know, do the filming. And of course, the Gerritsches uh, took great delight, mischievous delight, in watching the Germans get rid of their Holocaust Memorial. How to remember something you'd rather forget? By getting rid of it, you know, by getting rid of the monument, which they hoped would then return the burden of memory to those who come looking for it. And really returning the responsibility for memory to the visitors and not pretending to be remembering for them that the very best thing you can do against injustice is to take action. And this actually uh, ended up becoming a theme for the German Denkmal. Um, so when, our, when we get there in a little bit, <clears throat> I'll talk about the ways that uh, Joschka Fischer, uh, the then uh, 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 foreign secretary, invoked the Denkmal um, on the eve of uh, the attack against the Serbs to stop the certain genocide of Albanian Kosovars, Kosovar Albanians in 1995. So Joachim Geertz uh, kind of had this um, reputation. He was invited to come speak uh, and teach at the uh, Institute for Fine Arts in Zarbrücken. Uh, this uh, plaza, uh, surrounded by this kind of this castle, this Schloss, uh, had also been the headquarters, Nazi Gestapo headquarters uh, during the war. And um, so he invited uh, half the class to go out <clears throat> and steal cobblestones from other parts of the, of the town and then remove cobblestones from this plaza here and take these cobblestones back up to the classroom where the other other classmates were researching the names and places of every single Jewish cemetery destroyed by the Germans during World War II in Germany. Some 2,162 Jewish cemeteries destroyed. Uh, they inscribed the, the names of the, the towns where these cemeteries were lo located, uh, including the date on which they were doing this, this work. <clears throat> and then they took these to these stones back and restored them to the plaza. <clears throat> but of course, this being a Jochen Gertz production, they restored these stones inscribed side down so that there's no sign of what they had done. Um, basically, the process was much more important than the so-called end result. And this was an important point they wanted to make as well. <clears throat> the memorializing something um, is an active, uh, pedagogical process and what you end up with ends up being the least important of the process that created that design. <clears throat> and to emphasize process over result, uh, again, was one of the, the, the main lessons uh, they, they wanted. They said that way, everybody has to keep on processing, keep on making, keep on creating these memorial spaces 
and not make one not not be not not go one and done, make something to walk away from it. <laughs> Return the responsibility and the burden of memory to those who come looking for it. And so when the townspeople came down, of course, and they said, "Well, where's the where's the memorial?" Uh, you know, the students said, look, for your, look within yourselves for the memory you hope to find here. You know, they researched the names and places. They created a list of all the, all, all the cemeteries uh, destroyed. And now uh, they would educate people by making them, you know, kind of uh, uh, do the same kind of self-education. So Horst Hoheisel, who in 1995 would propose blowing up the Brandenburger Tour, <clears throat> um, in 1986 won a competition for a memorial uh, to commemorate uh, something called the Aschrot Fountain, or Aschrot Brunnen in, in German, a fountain which had been donated <clears throat> by a local Jewish uh, philanthropist to the town of Kassel in 1911. It was, as you see its form here, uh, kind of a neo-Gothic pyramid uh, with, a, with a little reflecting pool around it. And um, it had been destroyed by the Nazis in 1938 <clears throat> because Zygmunt Aschroth uh, was a member of the Jewish community in Kassel. Uh, they, the Nazis uh, tore it down, they filled it with dirt, put plants over it, and then they called it Aschroth's Grab or Aschroth's Grave. And so in the early 80s, um, the town of Kassel wanted to either restore it or at least commemorate this violence against a um, kind of a, a town landmark <clears throat> that had been donated to the town by, uh, um, uh, by a Jewish philanthropist. Hoheisel proposed taking the original form of the pyramid, um, but not restoring it, um, but turning it into the ground. <clears throat> creating a negative space in the ground. Remember, he's doing this in light of Maya Lin's negative space, uh, 1982. Um, he and Jochen Gertz uh, did not know each other, uh, neither uh, Esther Schellow Gertz. Um, he didn't know that the Gertzes had proposed at exactly the same time this disappearing memorial in Harburg. Um, and here he is creating uh, what amounts also to an invisible memorial, a memorial built into the ground. Uh, which he hoped would become a, um, a, a pedestal for the people who come looking for memory. So that only the only standing forms are those uh, vertical forms are the people uh, in, this, in this place looking for memory. So instead of kind of a, a fountain with a, you know, with a spray feature, um, this has water coming up in this channel around here um, every 15 minutes filling it and then flooding down into the space below so that you can hear the water flooding down. And if you look through these windows, you can actually see the mirrored reflection of the pyramid. But as now you see only its negative form, uh, you know, at your feet. And you become the memorial for which you search. The only vertical form here are the people now looking for memory. And this wasn't coordinated. This wasn't like something that, that, that everybody was talking about, but there was this preoccupation with absence. Uh, the murdered are absent. They're unable to remember for them themselves. Their families are, don't exist because uh, they were murdered too. And how to, uh, how to formalize absence without filling it in, how to remember the void left behind without filling it in and without creating a thing of beauty somehow that would redeem such such terror, you know, with beauty and with you know great coherent meaning, was something that um, niggled at all this whole generation. And the more they tried to remember this national crime, the more convinced they became that it first almost couldn't be done, but that the process of trying was much more important than succeeding or even failing. You just had to keep trying, doing it over and over again. Uh, just a few years later, uh, Misha Ullmann, uh, an Israeli artist living half-time in Berlin, won a competition for the um, what they call the uh, the book burnings that took place on the Babelplatz right here in the center of Berlin, right across the street from the Opera and the Humboldt University. Um, 
Misha Ullman was also somebody preoccupied by, um, by absence. He had been the artist who created uh, in Israel a series of, of, of ditches or graves that had to be viewed by visitors lying down and looking up at the sky through the, the jagged bits of earth around them. Um, so this was already his vernacular in a way. So he created this memorial, which he called a uh, bibliotheque or library, in which he took two steel tablets, um, one where the people are standing, the other one in the foreground here on the left, um, one describing uh, the Nazi book burnings of uh, March 1933, um, and the other uh, with a simple quote from Heinrich Heine, a uh, great German Jewish poet, who wrote at one point um, that where Jews are burned, uh, where books are burned, so one day uh, too will uh, people be burned as well. And um, when you go over to the window in between those, once again, we realize that the only vertical forms in this plaza are the people standing above the window looking into the memorial. And this is what they see is a, a room full of empty bookshelves. The authors are gone, the books are gone, they can't be compensated, they can't be redeemed, they can't be repaired, you can't bring them back. And so absence is remembered with absence, the void is remembered with a void. And again, this is, this is the artist trying to create a way to formalize the absence left behind without filling it in and without filling it in with too much meaning. The main meaning here being that they're gone and their deaths cannot be compensated and the memorials cannot redeem what has been lost and never to be reclaimed. This preoccupation with absence also informed Rachel Whiteweed's um, uh, Vienna Memorial at the Judenplatz, uh, Austria's National Holocaust Memorial, um, also called Bibliothek. Uh, she uh, felt that the people of the book, you know, should be remembered uh, with a kind of a, a bookish, with a bookish theme, Bibliothek. So but what she proposed, um, and again, this is within her vernacular, um, this generation of artists um, very much concerned with, um, in her words, um, seeing um, uh, basically all materiality becoming an index of absence somehow. So she created this kind of uh, cenotaph form um, in which the spaces between the books on a library wall and the walls themselves is what she has here articulated. So that it looks like the leaves of the books you know, who are, that are kind of put against the wall, but it's actually that little space between the wall and the, and the leaves of the books. So she wanted, again, to create, you know, use this, you know, material, um, you know kind of, invoke the materiality you know, as an index of absence, as she had done um, in other projects, such as her, her kind of um, most famous work called um, Row House, in which she filled uh, a house that was about to be torn down with concrete, filling in all the absent spaces there, the empty spaces with concrete, so that when they took the house down, you're left only with the, the space between spaces between the walls that are articulated you know, in this concrete. You know, how to show absence again without filling it in. Um, the, the city at first wasn't, a, it, it, it's won a competition um, uh, unanim unanimously. The city wasn't sure about it. Um, and this, and in preparing um, the grounds for building the memorial, it's something that now we need to may be thinking about also. They discovered, of course, uh, why this plaza was called Judenplatz or the you know, Jew, Jews Plaza. And it's because on this site in 1523, uh, the Jewish synagogue had been filled with all of its, all the Jews in this community and set on fire and auto de fe and, and murdered. Um, uh, in a, what was a fairly common kind of pogrom technique in, in that part of the world. 
So as they're now preparing and excavating, um, uh, they found actually the, um, uh, the remains of the synagogue. They didn't find human remains there. They, they had been already you know, taken away. And many of the people in the neighborhood said, well, look, maybe we should just make this excavation, um, you know, the, the Holocaust Memorial, you know. And they said, well, in fact, it's al already been noted, but the way it was phrased um, <laughs> uh, later, later that century was in a uh, beautiful tapestry in one of the, the nearby churches that on the site in 1523, uh, the Hebrew dogs were punished for their terrible crimes. So basically, it was a pogrom that was being celebrated, not just commemorated, but celebrated by the local community. And so they realized they, they couldn't use that to commemorate the Jews of the Holocaust, the murdered Jews of the Holocaust. So they went ahead and, and built it, and it stands there today. But again, this preoccupation with absence and, and the void and how to articulate that and formalize that uh, remains very, very active <clears throat> in this artist's mind. <clears throat> um, just after the Berlin Wall came down, an American artist, <clears throat> California-based, moved to Berlin. His name was Shimon Ati. Uh, Shimon went to Berlin um, just to live in what would be the new Berlin. He, he was going to make art. He wasn't sure what he was going to do but he realized that he was now haunted by what he didn't see anywhere. Um, the erasure, if you will, of, of Jewish life uh, in this neighborhood in the middle of Berlin. So he went back and researched um, what had been in this particular neighborhood and what's called the Schoenenviertel or the right in the very middle of Berlin near Alexanderplatz. And um, he found hundreds and hundreds of photographs, mostly of stateless Jews during the twenties and early thirties uh, kicked out of Poland or, you know, uh, with no papers and came to live in Berlin and open bookstores and bakeries, um, had Jewish theater, um, no sign of which remains to this day. So he went and researched the exact places where these photographs were taken. And then he created slides out of these photographs and without announcing it to anybody, showed up and just projected them back onto the same sites where they had originally been taken. So this was a, a Jewish bookstore, a Jewish bookseller in the same doorway where the picture was taken. And he now projected that back onto the building, realizing that by themselves, these buildings are completely amnesiac. That what they demand is our own knowledge, our own memory, which we project back onto them. And that is how we animate otherwise inanimate objects with memory. It depends on us projecting onto them just as he projected these images on, onto the walls where the pictures were originally taken. And the effect is quite uncanny because it feels like you're pulling, you know, you're, you're kind of pulling off the facade to see what was buried underneath. <clears throat> a bit of a palimpsest. Jewish theater, uh, Jewish bakery, Jewish theater. And again, that preoccupation with absence, what the eye does not see, but what is in the internal eyes, what is in the mind's internal eye and how we inevitably animate these otherwise inanimate sites with our own memory of what happened. And then finally, we get to the, um, the Denk Mall or the National uh, Memorial uh, located in Berlin <clears throat> to Europe's murdered Jews. Um, the first competition uh, for which Horst Hoheisel had submitted the, the blowing up the Brandenburger tour uh, was a, a gigantic competition, but the winning design was terrible. Um, it was kind of a, chosen by a committee of people um, made up of the German parliament, uh, a citizens group <clears throat> and the German and the Berlin Senate. And um, it was to cover this five acre space, uh, which you'll see in a few minutes, with a slab of concrete tilted from one meter high on one side to 11 meters high on the other side, um, engraved with the names of 4.2 million murder Jews, and then covered with 18 boulders imported from Masada, Israel. Masada, the site, of course, uh, 
a uh, the mass suicide of Jewish zealots as the Romans uh, were ascending this mountain to take them back as slaves <clears throat> after the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 70 in the Common Era. Uh, Masada was breached um, in 70, 76, 77. And the remaining Jews up there, some 700 of them, committed suicide rather than being taken as slaves and it became its own, its own monument, both to zealotry on the one hand, but also to the last stand of the Jews in Jerusalem. Um, so using boulders from Masada, the site of a national you know, kind of suicide in the face of, of being taken back to Rome as slaves, as an emblem of any sort for the Holocaust, the murdered Jews of Europe, made no sense, obviously at all. And only 4.2 million names, because that's all they feel, felt they could, they could find, which you know, may be true. Um, so that competition was voided. And in 1997, I was asked to come uh, give the last of a series of talks in Berlin to kind of, um, um, to kind of explain uh, what I thought Germany's memorial, Holocaust Memorial problem was. And I said, look, you're, you're trying to do something nobody's ever done before. Um, you're trying to integrate your national crime uh, into your memorial landscape and make it part of your, uh, your national heritage. I said, where in the US, where on the Washington Mall is there even one little pebble to commemorate the Middle Passage? or one little pebble to commemorate the slave auctions, which were actually held on the National Mall in Washington, DC. We have none of it. We have America's you know, two great crimes, you know, the genocide of Native Americans, indigenous peoples, and, um, and slavery, you know, 400 years, 300 years of slavery, nothing, un unremembered on the National Mall. You know, so you're trying to do something that nobody's really done before. And I said, um, you know, maybe in fact, you know, uh, maybe in fact, you should just have a thousand years of Holocaust memorial competitions without any final solution to your memorial problem, you know, which is how to reunite your country in the bedrock memory of a national crime. So I showed them slides of how um, Poles, Americans, Israelis, uh, Germans have you know, remembered the Holocaust, that what, what you're trying, what you've done before. Um, I talk, talked about counter monuments. I talked about days of remembrance, and they saw that every country had its own problems, um, commemorative problems with the Holocaust and World War II, and that theirs just happened to be the most severe because they were the, the perpetrators trying to remember their victims. I said, which never happens. So I came home and the next day I had a phone call asking if I would be part of a jury for a new national competition, international competition. And I said, but only if um, we make as a presses for the competition, an invitation to articulate the problem, the question without providing an answer. We want architecture that asks the question, how to commemorate a people murdered in the national name, but without providing an answer. So they said, okay. And I said, and it might be, be a competition that fails and we have to be allowed to fail. We can't be kind of defensively forced into finding something that might not exist. <clears throat> and they agreed to that too. So we ended up with three finalists. This one by Daniel Liebeskin. what he called stone breath. Um, what's nice about it and what we liked about it was that he allowed the, the kind of the plaza for the memorial to run across the street into the Tiergarten uh, here at the left um, where there's a bust of Goethe right at the tip there. So he's now kind of created this uh, matrix, Goethe just out of sight under these trees, his memorial, which is basically a broken wall. Um, and voids uh, within this broken wall. So it's um, again, the, um, the, the rifts in the wall and the breaks in the wall, the impossibility of, of uh, mending these breaks, creating wounds that can't be mended. Um, and it also 
would remind everybody of the voids that he built into the Jewish Museum design, which is just a couple miles away. A design which has six gigantic voids built into it, you know, kind of so-called uh, reverse, um, uh, you know, reverse uh, carrying walls, bearing walls. So we didn't choose this, but we liked again, um, something that um, seemed to pick up on the landscape around it. This one we liked a lot, but Gesina Weinmiller, a local uh, German uh, architect, a uh, young woman. Uh, and this was actually my favorite of all the designs. This received three of five first place vo votes on our first round of voting. Uh, and you can see the debt this design has also to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. This is a, a negative space carved into the ground. Instead of a triangular space, it's got you know three sides. Um, you enter it from one, everybody would have to find their way in and around these segments of uh, limestone blocks. Uh, the limestone blocks would be this, basically the same uh, size as those constituting the Western Wall, the so-called Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, the Kotel. Um, 18 of these segments would be scattered randomly in this square, inviting everybody to find their way in and around them. But we noticed as we walked along this, the parapet here and got right to the right-hand corner, that in looking, we could see that as we approached that corner, these segments would compose themselves into a star of David, a Jewish star. And then as we continued walking, they would decompose. So there'd be the kind of the composition of the star and then the decomposition of the star, which was, which was deliberate, um, but which uh, she didn't tell us about, of course. So we liked it on the one hand, but we feared that it would become a bit of a gimmick on the other hand, everybody jostling to see this and kind of, it, it, it becomes kind of a, a weird you know, red herring uh, when you're here to, to remember you know, the Jews and basically what you're caught up in is kind of the, the tricks of design you know, an illusion of design in some way. But, but we did like this a lot. Eventually, um, the only other first place votes uh, came to this design by Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra. Eisenman, an American architect. Serra, um, maybe America's greatest, you know, large form sculptor uh, at this point, famous for his Cortens uh, steel uh, um, ellipses. <clears throat> Uh, his torqued ellipses, and also famous uh, for um, the wall he built in Lower Manhattan, uh, you know, Tilted Arc, which uh, which had to be you know torn down because it was dividing this public space. So controversial on the one hand, but always true to his vision. And here they proposed four thousand two hundred stelae, ranging in height from ground level to uh, almost thirty feet tall. Um, the whole five acre plaza would be covered with these, um, 93 centimeters between them, just enough room for one person to kind of squeeze through. It would become a huge maze. You would clearly get lost. Uh, it would clearly block out the city. It'd be very dark even during the daytime. There's these you know, gigantic forms, but it was undulating. It was animated. Um, it was meant to be kind of this waving field of stelle. Here was the site it was scheduled for, a big void. Many people proposed just keeping this void as it is. Uh, this was the ministerial gardens in what had previously been kind of a so-called no man's land uh, divided by the Berlin Wall with the Brandenburger Tor just to the left <coughs> of, of the wall in East, the East German side. And where he's pointing here um, would be where the memorial would go. And if you, let's see. So I don't know if you have this little band here, or probably not. I can. So see the East German flag, right at the tip of that East German flag was Hitler's bunker, where Hitler's remains uh, were found uh, by the Red Army as they liberated Berlin. Um, so this was definitely no man's land. Uh, Landmines, uh, the, the wall here, many uh, East Germans died trying to get over the wall right here um, after it was built. And when the wall came down, 
um, it was decided that this would be the best because it was unusable otherwise, the best place for the National Memorial to Europe's murdered Jews. So we, that we were five jurors. <clears throat> uh, we decided that we would go with this design, but we wanted to uh, make recommendations, including scaling it down. We did not want uh, children running out over the tops of these memorials uh, and falling and injuring themselves. Um, we, we liked that on the one hand, it would be very oppressive and very threatening. And Richard Serra said from the beginning that I make my work dangerous. Uh, workers are often killed when my torch ellipses fall on them when they're installing, which was not at all reassuring. We said, we like the idea of Germany's National Memorial being dangerous. But, but only figuratively dangerous, you know, um, oppressive, but only figuratively oppressive. We don't want people actually never coming out. We don't want people getting lost or injured. Um, and Sarah said, okay. Um, and Eisenman said, okay, so I'll scale it down. So Eisenman proposed another design, which he did not tell Sarah about. This one with 2,711 stelle, now going um, from ground level, you see here just up to about maybe six or seven feet tall, uh, at which point Sarah, when he discovered this, uh, withdrew from the project, said, um, if you change it, it's no longer, you know, the scale of work that I do, it's no longer mine, it no longer has my logic in it, um, everybody agreed. So he left the project, leaving it to uh, Peter Eisenman only. Uh, we made the recommendation uh, that the German government um, accept this design, and we eventually had them <clears throat> vote, uh, when the vote came, to vote on three parts of it. First, do you want a national central memorial to Europe's murdered Jews on this site in Berlin? Uh, second, do you want the Peter Eisenman design, which we we recommend to you that, that we bring you from this competition. <clears throat> and third, do you want a place of information built underneath it? So that this abstract design would now be underpinned by very clear historical narrative. Um, because by itself, you know, the stele, you know, their stones, they look a little bit, you know, mausoleum like or a little bit um, um, tombstone like, but there's no writing on them. Uh, they're different sizes. So the effects is of this kind of animated field, you know, like blowing in the wind, blowing, blowing wheat. Um, <clears throat> but that was, yeah, we, we'd made the recommendation. So uh, the Bundestag did in fact vote on it. Uh, they accepted all three of those uh, things and they went on to build it. And then the German elections happened in <clears throat> uh, 1998. Uh, and it was all put on hold and the memorial got turned into a political football. Which, which of course these memorials do. Um, Gerhard <coughs> Schroeder and Michael Naumann uh, of the Social, Democrat, so Social Democratic Party hated this design um, and they wanted to uh, have basically a big library instead or a big museum instead. Um, <clears throat> but this was the design that you know, we proposed to them, but they thought it, it was too closely linked to Helmut Kohl because Kohl, Cole's government had actually appointed us as jurors. Um, back and forth they went. Uh, the Social Democrats uh, won the election or won enough uh, uh, votes to put together a governing coalition. But when they went to put together their governing coalition, they had to approach the Green Party to join them to create a government. And the Green Party agreed to join. <clears throat> uh, Joschka Fischer was the head of the Green Party but only on the condition that the memorial get built. Joschka Fischer said, yes, we will join, but the deck mall comes with us. And so they basically had to <clears throat> purse their lips and agree. And so the memorial itself went forward. Joschka Fischer was then appointed a uh, foreign minister. And Joschka Fischer was then the one who justified the German Air Force joining the NATO bombing campaign of Serbia and allowing German planes to leave German soil for the very first time in a bombing campaign of another country in order to stop a certain genocide of Kosovar Albanians. 
So he said, building the memorial is not enough unless we act on this memory. And building it by itself cannot become a substitute for intervention to stop a new genocide. So that action, you know, inspired by this memorial was just as just as important as the memorial itself. And again, something that you remember Jochen Gert said, uh, Jochen Esther said in the very beginning, in the end, only we can rise up against injustice. Our memorials don't rise up against injustice, only we can. And that's what this memorial inspired. So you see the Stelle, the memorial was built. <clears throat> um, one of the great innovations uh, was in fact, building this memorial on top of what would become probably Europe's greatest small Holocaust museum, what they call the Police of Information. The field, the, the waving field, you know, works. It's, it looks like it's moving and it's not completely dead and inanimate. This is kind of what makes it a bit of a counter monument, but it's also very monumental. And these, these stele, these pillars are quite tall, in fact. <clears throat> They allow you to kind of go in and be, you know, in and among them, you get lost, you have to find your way through. There are as many paths through as there are people coming in. People stand on them, they have picnics on them, <clears throat> they party a little bit inside. Uh, all these all these things are supposed to be forbidden. The tourists come, millions of people a year come to visit this memorial. And it is a uh, built on top of, you can see the pathway down, a place of information, a four room um, uh, museum, basically a Holocaust museum, which underpins this very abstract design above ground with very hard historical narrative. <clears throat> so we get this yin and yang effect of the abstract stele above seeming to sink into the space below, thereby defining the space of the hard historical narrative. Hard historical narrative as a foundation for abstract memorial design above. This inspired um, in some ways the 9-11 memorial and museum. Uh, you'll know, you know that the, the, the memorial <clears throat> is an abstract design of the two reflecting pools but is undergirded by the very hard history of the day at the 9-11 uh, uh, Museum. And this is how that arc, you know, works. Um, the stele being uh, underdetermined on the one hand, minimalist uh, also on the other. Uh, Maya Lins was also a very minimalist design with the names of uh, uh, the fallen soldiers arranged um, chronologically in the order in which they fell. They're not arranged alphabetically. So it's re-embedded with history. And this design here would actually now be, you know, re-embed itself or now build itself on top of this hard historical narrative below. And we have, in fact, come to realize that probably um, America now owes a weird debt to the German artists and architects who've yeah, presented this generation of counter monuments, counter memorial designs uh, and forms which challenge conventional memorials. <clears throat> um, as we now finally, belatedly, way too late, begin to cope with our own, if, if we will, memorial demons and our own national crimes against indigenous people and specifically now against the victims of lynching <clears throat> and, and uh, and enslavement. Of course, the kids do run out over the tops of these, as you see here. So an interesting theme <clears throat> and just kind of a bridge, um, a German artist in the mid nineties, Gunther Denwig, uh, without really announcing it, <clears throat> began researching the homes of Jewish victims who were uh, taken from their homes and sent to various concentration camps where they were killed. And he began embedding in front of these homes, little brass cobblestones engraved with the names 
of the families and people who had once lived at these houses. So here, these, these photographs I took in Hamburg uh, a few years ago, but anywhere you go in town, you're gonna see these, what they call Stolpersteine or stumbling stones, which are slightly elevated above the cobblestones next to them. So they're meant to, if, if you will, trip, trip up pedestrians who aren't watching where they're going and remind people who once lived in this house and, and where they were taken. You know, here lived, you know, Raylina Bodenheimer, you know, born, you know, Raylina Wolf, deported in 1942 to Theresienstadt, where she was murdered <clears throat> on the 7th of February, 1943. And her husband, you know, Bernhard Bodenheimer, deported in 1942, murdered in Majdanek. <clears throat> so very simply, uh, he has now installed uh, tens of thousands of these stones throughout Europe. <clears throat> people, there's a huge database. Uh, people have to book, book his services uh, months, even years in advance um, as they discover where their families lived. <clears throat> and he just does this. So he, he pulls up, he has these made, he pulls up in his little working van, he wears overalls, he puts these down, brushes himself off and leaves, and often leaves the families here to have a little ceremony. But these stumbling stones, again, memorials against the national grain, they're meant to trip you up. They're meant to confront you with your own past. Another fascinating design in, um, <clears throat> in kind of the, e <clears throat> the east of Germany by Horst Toheisel was to take the uh, remains, the foundation of the synagogue that was burned down on Kristallnacht and to build a wall on top of this foundation, completely enclosed, so there's no way in and no way out of the space. So this is now a 10 foot tall wall built on the foundations of the synagogue, <clears throat> leaving an empty space inside, which he knew would be filled up with seeds dropped by birds and bird droppings, trees and bushes planting themselves in this space, now coming out over the tops of these walls. <clears throat> So he's created the space of emptiness, devoid now of the Jews now displaced by the, the, the Kristallnacht, the you know, burning of the synagogue, the night of broken glass, um, the Jews themselves mostly gone and, and murdered after. This, this void remembering them, but the void itself now is filled with new life of trees. And this is a, a bit of a, um, what I would call the generation now of green memorials, life remembering life. <clears throat> you know, living forms remembering the life that now has inspired them. A little bit like the trees at the, at the, um, at the National 9-11 Memorial Museum, where regeneration becomes part of the memorial design. Life regenerated. Not just remembering absence and void, but now remembering the lives that were taken. So now that you've seen the, the deck mall design, <clears throat> Brian Stevenson's uh, Equal Justice Initiative um, uh, initiated and, and then had built this National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, which is also known as the Lynching Memorial, beginning with these uh, uh, figurative, human, humanly proportioned figures as you enter the space. And then on this wall is the complete story of racial terror uh, in this country, leading to a space where he has uh, just a little over 800, I think about 804 of these stella, these concrete, uh, these corten steel stella. Um, each one for a county where lynchings had occurred, each one with the names of the lynching victims on them, some 804. As you enter, they're ground level and they're, they're very clearly human proportion. Each one's uh, six, feet, six feet tall. They're alternately called stele or monuments or, or forms, human forms. And as you continue walking, <clears throat> the ground begins dropping out from beneath your feet. And as a result, these stele are no longer ground level, but begin to rise above your head as you 
proceed underneath them. They're not anchored in the ground as the stelae are in the Denkmal, but these are hanging from the heavens. They're, clearly it's a reference to lynching. These are bodies hanging over you, each with the county's name on them and each lined uh, with the names of the actual lynching victims. There is a duplicate set of all of these monuments or stelae stacked on the grounds of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Um, each one with the county name on it, each one waiting for the county named on it to come claim it and take it back home to create its own lynching memorial, right where the lynching happened or right in you know, the town seat. Um, by making this a mobile monument, these will remain, but now demanding that every county claim its history and find a way to commemorate the lynching victims in its own way. And uh, Jefferson County, uh, where Birmingham uh, is located, is actually the, going to be the first place to actually claim this memorial. But what happens when you go and then you see all these stacked, stacked monuments and you see the names, you know that that county has not yet claimed its history. So it's a provocation and it's an accusation and uh, until they do, they're going to be stacked there, reminding everybody uh, who hasn't actually claimed their history yet. It, it's a brilliant design. I mean, it's by far the most powerful, devastating um, memorial you know, we have in this country at this point. And um, so that's kind of my little tour of what you know, we might call these counter monuments or as memorials built against the national grain. And you can see that they, they are they are connected formally. Um, these don't prescribe what will come after, but everything that gets designed and built um, is informed in some way by what came before them. And so we just keep these kinds of things in mind and the debates they had and the processes by which these uh, were, were conceived and eventually built um, as we begin to wrestle with how to commemorate the peoples in our midst and the indigenous peoples in our midst um, who have actually not really been erased, uh, but whose memory supposedly has been erased. And is this this the, the myth of erasure might be, be you know one of the one of the starting points you know for discussions on how to commemorate these these indigenous people, the first peoples of this on this continent. So I guess with that, um, I'm glad just to open up and take questions. If that seems right to you, that seem good? Sure, yes. Um, so- uh, I can put this up or we can go to a full screen so we can see everybody, whatever you would like. Sure, whichever. Um, I just, uh, thank you um, hugely. That was fascinating. I mean, truly fascinating. And I think of the way you did it, the arc of starting with Mile in and the evolution from there and the debate and the background and the history, it was just really um, completely fascinating. So thank you, thank you so much for kind of walking us through all that and have you know the photographs as well. It's really, really great to see. I've not been to Lynchburg to see that. Sure. Um, or many of those ones in Germany. So all super sure. interesting themes of, of absence. Um, so there, there are people are asking some questions and obviously, um, I mean, there's a lot of questions that get raised, but particularly obviously the theme as you brought up at the end of this whole series is about the presence and erasure of Native American culture and presence. Um, and I'm uh, just as an overall sort of general question, I'm wondering about what lessons you can sort of share about whether and when memorialization is even appropriate, just starting from then. And then when when does it go against the purpose of restoring justice? I mean, there are all these different themes you brought up of redemption. Is that the purpose of, you know, what is the purpose? And, and you know, you have different narratives of history, obviously. So I'll, I just love to hear your thoughts about that. And then I'll go to some. Sure. Um, a community that, you know, takes upon itself the responsibility to commemorate anything, whatever it's going to be. If it's commemorating 
um, enslavement, victims of slavery, indigenous people wiped out um, uh, by disease, uh, you know, by slaughter. They have to ask themselves be before beginning a process, toward what end are we designing and proposing this memorial? It has to be very clear to their minds. Are we doing this for reasons of somehow compensating terrible loss? Are we doing this as it's very clear they do for the Equal Justice Initiative where memory is a way um, of you know, bending the arc toward justice, that memory is a way of justice of, and achieving justice. Is that why we're doing it? it that, that's as good a reason you know, as any. I mean, the German artists had to ask themselves toward what end are they remembering uh, a people murdered in their national name? And you know, the answers they come up with are, are various. Um, some of it might be the expiation of you know, felt inherited guilt somehow. Um, some of it might be compensatory, compensatory, even though this whole generation does not believe in the concept of repair and Wiedergutmachung, the idea that a mass murder can be repaired in any way by art leaves them furious. <clears throat> You know, that art becomes redemptory and becomes a compensation somehow. Say, so, no, art is not a compensation. There is no such thing as redemption of this terrible crime in art. That anti-Semitism was, a, was a, a redemptory crime in itself. You know, Hitler, you know, the Nazis murdered Jews as a weird way to <clears throat> redeem the losses of the war. I mean, uh, Hitler had said, infamously in his Mein Kampf, that if only at the end of the Great War, we had held under poison gas some 12 to 15,000 of these Hebrew subverters of our people, then all those who died on the front would not have died in vain. So mass murder was a, for him a, a weird redemption of, for World War I. So these things have to be, um, they, they just have to, the space has to be created for all these questions to arise. Are we doing this for them? <laughs> I mean, and what does that mean? Or are we giving indigenous peoples spaces to for, for them to remember their losses and to remember their crimes perpetrated against them by settlers? What are we doing? This just has to be asked and, and then answered very clearly. And so that these, you know, these reasons are part of the uh, process and designs will issue from this process. Um, and even if they're never built, at least the process will have asked these questions and to you know, make that part of the memory work itself. Are you aware sort of to that point and, and talking <clears throat> about the, the genocide of, of Native Americans about what kinds of conversations are going on about memorials and who is involved? Have the yeah. indigenous no. you know, press whether they want a memorial? So I'm just curious of what you know about what conversations are actually going on. Um, <clears throat> I hear conversations going on uh, among, say, the, the neighbors of tribes. Um, I think uh, different tribes have actually, obviously, different traditions, even memorial traditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would they suggest these traditions um, for their neighbors to appropriate in order to remember you know, past generations? I mean, that those are the real questions. Or are these actually conversations between the tribes and you know, uh, the generations of settlers like us who came after? And I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're both these conversations are just are just beginning. Um, one of the parallels, maybe, you know, in, in Germany, the uh, German Jews wanted nothing to do with the Denkmal. <clears throat> so this is Germany's memorial to remember the Jews murdered in the national name. <clears throat> this is not our memorial. We we have our commemorations. We've got our days of remembrance. We've got our our own traditions, you know, religious traditions for remembrance. This is your memorial to remember the crimes you perpetrated. This is not our memorial. 
And that surprised lots of Germans who thought they were doing this for them. They said, you're not doing this for us. The German Jewish community said, you're doing this for yourselves. So you, you have to have your own reasons for doing it. <clears throat> you know, thanks, but no thanks. We will commemorate our own as we do. And that's something that I think we have to keep in mind here. Why are we doing this? Are we think we're doing this for them on, on their behalf as a compensation for them? Are we doing it? <clears throat> are we taking their voice away by doing it? Or are we going to commemorate, you know, kind of the, the, the national, you know, settler crimes, you know, in our name, taking responsibility. And again, this is where the Germans were so great during the 80s. Um, von Weizsäcker <clears throat> said at one point, you know, when the young Germans were saying, but we're, we didn't do the, we didn't make the Holocaust. We're not responsible for the Holocaust. And they said, you're right. You're not responsible for the mass murder, but you are responsible for the memory of the murder. Just draw that distinction. We're not, I'm not responsible for slavery, but I am responsible for the memory of the Middle Passage. I am responsible for the memory of Native Americans who were in our midst once upon a time. Yeah. So that, that distinction is just one that we, we, you know, we were wrestling with. And it probably, rather than being prescriptive and saying this is always gonna come up in every case, kind of go case by case, community by community and, and see who they are. Uh, Native Americans who are, who are vibrant contributing members of a community you know, may see themselves as, as both. You know, they are members of a tribe and they're members of the, the local community, university community, mm -hmm. um, local political boards. <clears throat> you know, they're doing this as both. And so I, I think it kind of goes uh, community by community. Yeah, and, and who it is, who's doing it, as you said, I mean. Exactly, and why they're doing it. Well, who and why, for whom, for whom, yeah. Um, there's a question here, um, as a question about the concept of the counter memorial. Now you can maybe, I don't know if you're reading them here, but in relation to the lynching memorial, is it counter as in countering dominant national narrative against the grain, or are there specific design elements that make it a counter memorial? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I would say it's both. Uh, the, the idea of a counter memorial <clears throat> uh, gets, gets to serve both purposes. Countering the traditional forms of the memorial, the traditional static uh, inanimacy um, and uh, overwhelming, often proportionally, uh, you know, inhumanely scaled uh, memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, so counterpointing those very traditional conventional memorial um, properties and counterpointing <clears throat> the, um, you know, the dominant national myth or, or narrative going against the grain of the national narrative that would picture, <clears throat> yeah, that pictures this country as, you know, a country, of the, you know, the land of the free and the home of the brave and, <clears throat> and completely discounts that there was actually uh, peoples, you know, hundreds of different tribes living here, you know, when Europeans first arrived. So is so it's, it's doing doing both, and I think the the National Museum for um, you know, Peace and Justice um, counters both the forms and uh, you know says look at uh, racial history um, isn't just African American history; it's American history. It's Americans' history of us and how they treated us, mm -hmm. and how we you know we have been terrorized from the very beginning by definition. You know, brought over here on terror boats, in Middle Passage. And so both of those things are, are true. And you know, the young German artists and architects who are still wrestling with it there, but have kind of created the space in this dialogue that we now get to pick up on and, and try to figure out ourselves. I mean, when they were doing what they were doing, I used our, um, uh, our own complete lack of any memorials to, to slavery or to the genocide of Native Americans <clears throat> to illustrate the ways that nations never really make national crimes the center <clears throat> of their memorial cultures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, there was a question here or comment really about the National Memorial for Peace and Justice telling the complete story of racial terror in the US but the person commented, I would offer it began, you know, with the terrorizing of indigenous peoples. But I guess that is the intent. I mean, when you hear lynching museum, I mean, that you think, oh, it's just, just 
lynching, but in fact, maybe that's not that it that is the objective there. I mean, I don't not having right. seen that. <clears throat> no, it really is. I mean, they they mean that there's a whole museum actually, yeah, also you know nearby, walking distance away, um, which tells the story of racial terror <clears throat> in America. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's their work. It, it gets uh, it, it got uh, nicknamed in a way, you know, the lynching museum, but I hardly ever want to refer it to it that way because I think it reduces. Yeah. With, with the aim, the overall aim at the museum and memorial really is. Yeah, okay. Um, I know we're out of time. I'm just gonna bring up one one other point that somebody mentioned earlier on about the comment was after seeing how deeply these artists have considered how to memorialize absence. It really was fascinating. I'm, I am challenged by the thought of memorializing presence and resilience and persistence of the native people of New England, despite the onslaught of the colonizers, yeah. and I, just, you know, the, I think the, your thoughts about that, about acknowledging resilience, a bit, as opposed to this, the, the theme of absence and erasure. Yeah, remember, yeah, remembering life with life is one of the life, uh, also yeah. one of the great innovations of, of yeah. contemporary memorials, and not focusing on the the moment of destruction itself, <clears throat> but yeah. but looking at um, uh, at the life that was lost and how to commemorate loss again, without without filling it in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I feel like we should let you go, um, okay. but I cannot thank you enough. That was a fabulous talk and um, gives us a lot to think about and and work with. Okay, well, great. Well, I'm glad to stay in touch and uh, yeah. so listen in on you know, your next all your next talks. Yep. And uh, congratulations on opening that space, you know, for trying to figure these things out. Yeah. It's a it's a work in process, but really appreciate your contribution. So just just to conclude, for those of you who are interested in participating in the series in a more hands on way, we are beginning working groups looking at some of these issues like memorialization, like land justice, like decolonizing curricula. So there are a number of areas. Um, so that's where we're kind of shifting to more working groups. So if you're interested, just go to the Karuna website and please sign up. Um, and we will be, we're going to be having some upcoming talks um, with some of the other members of the advisory committee. So keep your eyes out for that. So thank you again on behalf okay. of all of us. Thank you for hosting all this. The, fabulous. All and thank you all for attending. It was okay. really great. Take care. Take care. Thanks so much. <laughs>